conference of any kind really is a great opportunity for people within a particular niche to come together to discuss particular topics or subjects or share information within that niche. And as you can imagine, a writer's conference largely has to do with writing or with marketing your books or with social media or with publication, etc. They typically happen in the spring. In fact, I have a little graphic that I'm gonna pop up on my screen here that shows the different publishing seasons. And the spring is often known as conference season because this is a great opportunity to network, to query. Publishers can afford to take literary risks. So a lot of writers conferences are going to happen around the March, April kind of timeline. But if you're just curious to know about publishing seasons in general, you can pause this video, take a deeper look at this graphic. But I did kind of want to show that to you if you're kind of new to the game. And I would say that one of the most important things about going to a conference, especially for writers who are just starting out, is setting goals so that you know post-conference whether or not something like that was maybe worth it for you. I have my windows open in case you can hear like clacking in the background. There's a few things that you're gonna wanna prep ahead of time. It's gonna be your author brand, your business card, your itinerary, making sure that you have a good idea of what's happening, what you wanna see, et cetera, your online platform, as well as talking about things that you don't need. Because if we talk about what you need, we need to talk about what you don't need. So let's talk about your author brand. Even if you haven't written anything before, if you haven't published anything before, if you have no written materials at all to your name, it's a literal zero. That was me, I promise you. That doesn't mean that you don't have a reason to not have an author brand. I think of a brand as a controlled perception, right? How do you want people to see you? How do you want people to interpret you? How do you want people to look at you? And especially if you're starting out from scratch, that's gonna be really important because people who are on really quick timelines, like agents, for example, or editors or someone, or maybe even other peers that you wanna, that you wanna network with, you're gonna be doing a lot of speed networking and it helps, to, it, it helps to help people know how to categorize you or think of you in your brain. What kind of association do you wanna assign to yourself? That's essentially your brand. Whether or not you already have something written, whether or not you've already published, whether or not you have a project in progress or not, you're definitely going to want a website. I actually remade an older video of mine walking you through how to make a really simple author website. If you have never written or published anything before, you should definitely check that out. It's on Squarespace. I hosted my website on Squarespace for probably the better part of five years. I'm on WordPress now. WordPress is kind of like, WordPress is like where you want to be if you care a lot about SEO, search engine optimization which will be really important as you start to build your brand further out. If you want to be known for your book, if you want to be known for writing certain kinds of books, if you decide that you want to use your book as a lead magnet to get more business, all that stuff is really good to know. So if you want to check that out, highly recommend doing that after this video. You also want to identify the kind of niche that you're in. This isn't necessarily about genre, but this is also like, what kind of stuff do you talk about? Where are you placing yourself? So an example for me is I try to place myself as like the fulcrum between books and business, right? Because your books, your brand, your business, all of those things tie together. And not many people know about that, especially if they're just starting out. If you would consider yourself a romance writer, for example, if we're fiction, I'm a nonfiction girl, but let's say that you're a romance fiction writer. What is specifically unique about your writing within that romance genre? Likewise, if you are a nonfiction author, the big question that you're going to have to ask is, why are you qualified to write this book? And that's where you're going to need to tap into, well, I do this thing in this way to help people do X without why or whatever, whatever. So you want to have a website. You want to know how you're placing yourself or positioning self within your niche. You want to have a certain, like a specific kind of style or personality that plays a lot into your brand. You want people to have some kind of experience whenever they come across you. You want to give them an experience and give them an association so that when they think of X, they're going to think of you. I prefer to have something that's a little laid back, but still kind of like snatched and put together. And it looks like professional and stuff, but without being stuffed you know, like I want to be grounded, but also be a little funky fresh every once in a while, right? And it's going to be worth thinking about how you want that to look for yourself. And lastly, if you're going to a writer's conference, you want to have some kind of project in mind that you're working on. If you're working on it, great. You can say, I am working on this type of book. This is what it's about. This is who it's for, etc. If you don't have anything in progress and you're just there to have a good time or learn and or sit back and kind of see how it all works, have a project in mind anyway, whether you're working on something, whether you're 
you're not working on something. If anyone asks you what you're working on, you don't wanna just come up empty handed, be like, well, I don't really quite know. I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that. No, what are you working on? It could be a fib, it could be real. Even if you have something that you're working on and someone asks like an agent, what else do you have in mind or what else are you working on? You wanna have a plan A and a plan B, even if it isn't quite accurate because you wanna show up prepared, right? So when I used to go to conferences and I've been to a fair amount of them, I'd say I've, I've, I've been to about four or five conferences within the past two years, I would say. Three of those maybe being writers conferences specifically. And whenever people would ask like, oh, what are you working on? I would say I'm writing a coming of age memoir all about my experience living and working in Yellowstone National Park as a seasonal employee, right? Which is true. And my book is actually somewhere that one at the end of the second shelf is my book and that's how I used to describe it. You want, and I'm gonna be talking about this in a, in a hot second too, but you wanna have a really quick, easy way of describing it and that's what I would say. I described my book in one sentence and people would get it. I would know what kind of reaction I'm getting from them. From them I could kind of test the waters. But if someone were to also ask me, you know, hey, that sounds great, what else are you working on? I would say, I'm also writing another memoir about my experience being a first year teacher at the sixth grade level, which I'm not working on that, but I could if I wanted to. To. You just, either way, you want to show up prepared. So all of those elements kind of culminate into your author brand, which is at least important to have an idea of or be able to kind of represent in some kind of way, whether it be on your website, whether it be through your personality, whether it be through your business card, which also happens to be the next thing that we're going to be talking about, coincidentally enough. Business cards are the new resume. For the love of God, do not carry around your resume at a writer's conference. Don't do that. Don't, 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 don't. Don't do that. From your homegirl, Lauren, from one friend, from one sister to another, please don't do that. Business cards are perfectly fine. You know why business cards are perfectly fine? Because they're short, sweet, to the point, and they should ideally have your social media information on it, which is where people are gonna go anyway. If they're not checking out your website, they're checking you out on social media. So you should not only include your social profiles or, or the one or ones that you're most active on, but you should also have your website listed on that. Absolutely, you should, socials and website. You also need to have some kind of title that you're giving yourself. I didn't really know what to call myself. I was an ex-teacher. I was a memoirist in the making. I guess I just called myself a writer, right? That seemed to be, that seemed to kind of be appropriate enough. So call yourself Joe Smith, fantasy writer, Susan Smith, whatever, whatever, you know, or if you're a nonfiction author wanting to get into the book game, but you have a business on the side, that's totally fine. Just give them your regular business card if it applies to your book as well. For example, I know someone who is on the board at my local library and he's a really great guy but I doubt he goes around conferences telling people that he is the board you know a board member of the library located in the Chicago area he's probably gonna give them something more in alignment with what his book brand is or what his budding author brand is if he were writing a book on how to run a library that kind of business card would make sense but if he's writing like science fiction those two things don't add up you're gonna confuse people you're gonna have to explain yourself I would just make a separate business card that's like hey I'm Joe Smith, I'm a fantasy writer, here's my website, my socials, whatever. So when it comes to your brand, when it comes to your perception, your how the kind of impression that you're making when other people see you, you just want it to make sense so that you eliminate any questions people have about you. You, you don't want there to be any discrepancies. People are running on limited time. You're gonna network with a lot of different people and in very short, quick bursts and you wanna maximize that amount of time as much as possible. So that's why you wanna show up prepared in that way. When it comes to social media, social media is the new resume. Your business card is a way of communicating that resume, but every if they're not looking at your website, they're gonna be looking at your social profiles like I mentioned. Because of this, you wanna have consistency in your branding, in your verbiage, in the kind of perception that you are creating for people. Remember, a brand is a controlled perception. It is something that you are creating to make it easier for people to categorize you or think about you or associate something with you in their brain. You want this information to be updated. You want this information to be communicated clearly. You want there to be a call to action. With anything that you give someone, you want there to be a second step. You're giving people direction. You're giving them instructions. Here's my business card. Oh, I see that they have an Instagram account. I should check that out. Hey, cool Instagram account. Oh, they have a link in their bio. It goes to their website. I should check that out. You go to their website. Oh, hey, this is their project that they're working on. I'm gonna click on that button to check that out. So you always want there to be a call to action so that you know how people can carry that controlled perception on their own through prompts. 
And whatever social platforms you share, whether that be verbally, whether that be in a business card, whatever, you want any posts that you have to be recent because I've come across people's profiles before where they'd be like, I'm a writer or, you know, this is what I do for a living. And then you go to their profile and it's like the last post was like 52 weeks ago. I'm not going to take you seriously and I'm going to run out of ways to learn more about you, which is such a bummer because I think the best reaction that you can ever get from anyone, whether you're a writer, whether you're an entrepreneur, whatever is curiosity. You can do so much with curiosity. If you can get someone from apathy to curiosity, that's a conversion that you can absolutely work with. What an opportunity to get someone interested and excited about your stuff. And if you have a dead end, like a really old post with nothing new, that's kind of a lost opportunity. I hate to think of it in such a high stakes way, but like I said, when you're at these conferences or any kind of networking event, you wanna be as prepared as you can so that people don't ask questions and that they have direction and know how to think of you and know, you know, what all these calls to action are. Instagram is a really good one. Instagram, hashtag bookstagram, book talk, TikTok. Those, those are probably the two biggest bookish platforms. If you're someone who's a nonfiction writer and your book leads into your business, if you're wanting to use, to use it as a lead magnet or something, LinkedIn might be a little more appropriate for you. Or if you want people to connect with you over Clubhouse, that's something that you can totally do. Or if you have a podcast or something, you know, you just, you just want there to be consistency. Now, if you have never been to a, to a conference or a writer's conference before, as it gets closer to the event, you are going to be communicated in itinerary. It's usually going to be over email, I would say. Um, sometimes it's on their website. If you register for a conference, they'll usually have like a loose outline of kind of what you can expect. Sometimes they have the schedule on their website and it's worth kind of giving it a once over just to see what's going on, the kind of flow that they have, the kinds of sessions that they can expect. They're most likely going to have main stage speakers. They're going to have a keynote speaker. They're going to have panel. And most importantly, they're going to have workshops and networking opportunities. And I think those two, the networking and the workshop opportunities, is where a lot of the power is. You want to know what kind of sessions you're interested in, right? It's like the first day of school, you get your class schedule. It helps to know where the classrooms are, right? So if you, I, I would take a minute, this isn't like a make or break, you know, if, if you do this last minute, it's fine. If you do this a week before, like me, because I'm a planter, that's totally fine as well. Just kind of take inventory of the kind of sessions that you're interested in, speakers that you you maybe want to hear from speakers that you want to meet, panels that you want to tune into, and also thinking about what you hope to gain from those different kinds of conversations and from those different kinds of networking opportunities. I think going to those workshops is a really great way to kind of refine your craft, to improve your approach. But if you're wanting something to come out of the event, you want to get connected with an editor, you want to get connected with an agent, you want to meet another romance writer, you want to meet another nonfiction writer, a lot of the power can, can be found in networking and as a diehard introvert, that stuff scares me. Not only am I an introvert, but I also have social anxiety, but I go out there, I treat it like a light switch. That's what I have to do with myself. That's just how I, that's just how my brain works. If I'm waking up in the morning and I know that I have this conference that I'm going to, or I'm going to be doing, you know, all these different kinds of extroverted things, I know that I'm going to have to turn it on for the next eight to 12 hours. And if it's on, it's going to stay on. So I'm going to be pushing myself out of my comfort zone a little bit, walking up to people, asking, hey, what what are you working on? Where are you from? Is this your first conference? Who are you excited to meet? What kind of workshops are you going to? You just, it doesn't hurt to have some of those little small talk topics to have in your back pocket. <laughs> You want to make yourself worth people's time. That's how you want to think about it. I hate to be so harsh, but I think that's just the best way to say it. Now let's talk about what you don't need, because I also think that's important. Please do not bring in your resume. You're not getting hired for a job. If you're going to a job career expo, yeah, probably a, a good time and place to do that. But for a writer's conference, no one's going to say, hey, Jimmy, cool project. Can I see your resume? Uh, no, that's what your business card is for. So please don't bring your resume. If you sign up for agent pitches or web Whatever. If you if you sign up for that kind of thing, first of all, good luck. I'm rooting for you. But do not bring your laptop, your iPad. Don't feel the need to put together a whole slideshow presentation. Please don't do that. You want to make it worth the agent's time. They are talking with 10 bajillion other people who are also nervous, who also have a work in progress that they want to have published. Make it worth their time by just dishing out the facts and being really clear on it. Think about it like Shark Tank. That's actually, that's actually probably a really good way to think about it. What are the facts and figures? What are the numbers? Numbers. How are you going to explain your book in one sentence? Who's the ideal audience? What's your word count? What are your publication goals? Don't bring your resume. Don't bring a slideshow presentation. Don't bring your iPad or your laptop to present something. Don't bring index cards with your pitch written down on them. 
just memorize one sentence about how you would describe your book. One sentence. That is all you need. Hi, my name is Lauren. I am writing a coming of age memoir all about my experience living and working in Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park as a housekeeper. It's intended for primarily young females ages 18 to 30. Word count is about 75,000 words. This is where I'm at with my progress. I hired a developmental editor. They're currently two months into editing. I'm expecting to finish that up within the next six months whatever just give them the facts and figures that's all they care about i promise you books are a business with facts and figures attached to them and lastly final thing i have to say um don't bring your manuscript bringing a manuscript along with the intent of giving it to someone is like bringing a pocket full of change expecting to dump that pocket full of change into someone else's pocket as a housekeeper with people who tipped in change i would have that jingling around in my pocket for 10 to 12 hours a day and i hated it every minute of it just give me your business card I'll call you, leave your resume at home if I want it, I will find a way. Have you ever seen that movie, He's Just Not That Into You? There's a line from it where one of the guys goes, the guy doesn't call you, he doesn't wanna call you. If a guy is into you, he will make it happen. He will find a way to call you, he will find a way to contact you. It's the same way with an agent. If they like you and your stuff enough, they will find a way to get their eyes and hands on your manuscript, but please do not bring it with you. Talk about who you are. They're probably most likely gonna, ask, it's like a job interview. They're probably gonna ask you, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself or tell me a little bit about your book, depending on how much time you have to work with and how many other people they're talking with. When you're describing who you are, you wanna talk about your past, present, and future. Hi, my name is Lauren. I have a background in elementary education. I taught for a year and then I decided to write this book after working in Yellowstone National Park for a summer. It was such a unique opportunity. This is what I'm doing right now. These are my plans for the future. And a really great way to describe your book is going to be called a log line, and they use this a lot in film production or movie production. It's usually a one sentence description of whatever the thing is that you're talking about is about. People use it a lot for books. Coming of age memoir about living and working in Yellowstone National Park as a young adult. Boom. That's my entire book in one sentence, two at the absolute maximum. Or if you have a hard time describing your book, you could say it's X meets Y, or it's sort of like a set in B, you know, you just want to give people a really easy snapshot for how to think about it in their brain, how to categorize it. And that pitch that I just said, a coming of age mom about working in Yellowstone, that I said that bet you 10,000 times I could repeat it in my sleep if I wanted to. And with that kind of pitch, I was able to get a lot of feedback, you know, through people's reactions or their facial expressions. And usually when I would give that kind of pitch, whether it's another writer, whether it's, you know, someone who works in the industry, they'd be like, oh, wow, that sounds really cool, actually. I know that that pitch works. I know that that line works. And if you feel like you're describing your book and people are kind of giving you these looks like, uh, yeah, that sounds, that sounds cool. You know, like you don't want, you don't want that high pitched stuff. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, You don't want that. You want, oh, that's really cool. So maybe just kind of practice around a little bit, kind of, you know, try out some of those different styles. It's a da 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 It also helps to know who your target audience is. Who is this book intended for? Give as much demographic, psychographic, or even behavioral information that you can give. Plug, plug the synopsis of your book into ChatGPT, see what it spits out. Find comparable or competitive titles on Amazon, and I say Amazon only because they have so many different filters that you can work with, to find a book that's similar to yours in audience or in content or in style. Plug it into chat GPT. Who is the ideal reader for Cheryl Strayed's Wild, right? That was the book that I kind of compared my book to. It's not quite a fair comparison because she's like a huge bestseller and I'm an Amazon bestseller, but that's the best comparison that I had. So maybe I would type in, into chat GPT, who is the ideal person for Cheryl Strayed's Wild, see what kind of demographic or psychographic whatever information I can pull from that and, you know, maybe lump it into my pitch if I'm given an opportunity to talk to an agent or someone, which that's actually another thing you should do. If you have not looked up comp titles, comparable or competitive titles, you probably should. There's been conversations around whether or not something like that is actually beneficial to publishers. But basically, if you're not familiar with what it is, it's just like I said, it's it's a book that's similar enough to yours and audience and style and content that has seen success in the past. And ideally, if, if you're a debut writer with no, you, you have no huge accolades behind you, you would generally want to avoid comparing your book to a number one 
New York Times bestseller because that's kind of a, you're you're comparing yourself to a number one New York Times bestseller. I really hope you hit that status one day, but until then, you're just Debbie from down the road with a new book trying to make it happen for yourself, right? So find a book on Amazon, maybe in a really niche category that best fits your book and audience style or content, see what you can find, plug it into chat GPT, see what other recommendations or comp titles that it has to, that it has to spit out as as along with your target audience. You also, this is going to be especially true for memoirists, but you are going to want to think about what your unique selling point is, your USP. That's something that people are gonna be wondering about. Hey, that's a really cool book idea. What's so special about it? They don't ask that to be rude. They're asking that to, again, think of a way to distinguish your book from all the rest and kind of lock it in the brain as, oh, that's Joey with this book. So in my case, I don't know of any other memoirs about people working in, in a national park. That's a unique selling point. Or you have Educated by Tara Westover. She grew up in a survivalist family where they did not believe in public education, yet she graduated from Cambridge with a PhD. Now that's a really unique selling point. It doesn't have to be quite that big, but just think of something that distinguishes you from the rest. Romanticy is such a huge genre right now. What is so special about yours that's gonna offer a little bit, a little, a little kind of a different flavor, right? If you're writing a nonfiction book, the question for you is going to be, why are you the one to write this book? What's special about you? It's not necessarily on the story. It's more about your capabilities, your background, your expertise that you're sharing, right? Because when it comes to fiction, it's all about the story. When it comes to nonfiction, it's all about the solution. What's so special about the story? Story, what's so special about the person giving the solution? And memoir is kind of in a funky in-between space where it's nonfiction, but it's heavily narrative so that it reads kind of like fiction. So in the case of memoir, you want to think about what is so unique about your book. Now, what needs to happen after a conference? I also think that's a really great question to ask. You're going to be meeting with a lot of people, whether it be editors, agents, panelists, marketers, other writers, whatever. The most important part post-conference is following up, fulfilling on what you say that you're going to do, fulfilling on the promises that you make, saying that you're going to send someone something and then actually doing it, right? It's just, that's just, that's just good professional practice. Even if you don't have anything to follow up with them on, if there's a couple people in particular that you really connected with, keep that relationship warm. You just met them. So reach out to them over email and be like, hey, it was really great to meet you. I see that you're in the area. We should grab a cup of coffee sometime. Or, you know, hey, keep me updated on your project. Or, hey, when your book launches, tell me what I can do to support it. Or I don't need an editor right now, but if I meet someone who's, you know, on the market looking around for one, I would be happy to, to refer you over to them. Just whether, whether there's something that you said that you were gonna do, something that you intend to do, either way, just follow up with the right people and just, say a quick hello, thank, thank them for whatever opportunity they gave them, follow up with additional information, tell them how, you know, other ways that they can reach you, whatever. And also have in mind, you know, people are gonna ask you, what can I do to support you? Whether now, whether you're launching your book later on, and it really helps to have an answer to that question. What is one of the biggest things people can do to support you? If someone asked me that right now, I would say, go, go to my YouTube channel, check out my stuff. And if you could just share one of my videos on your social media, that would be awesome. Right now, that's my biggest call to action. But maybe for you, it's, you know, I would love for you to be one of my amplifiers for when my book comes out, if you're cool with that kind of thing, right? I would love to, ha I would love to have you help with promoting it via word of mouth or leaving a review on Amazon or Goodreads or whatever. So I hope you found that helpful. I do want to wrap up this video with an exciting announcement that I want to make. I've never done one of these before. Actually, I have two announcements. The first one is that I started a Patreon page. It's only got one tier where I'm going to be posting a lot of cool stuff in addition to this regular YouTube content. I'm not necessarily making more videos, but I am doing a lot more interactive type stuff with you. I am going to be doing live streams. I'm going to be doing Q and A's. I'm going to be doing ask me anything. If I have people that I want to bring in to speak on a particular topic that I'm not as much of an expert in, I would love to bring them in as well. Or if I have cool events or opportunities that I want to, you know, that I, that I want you to be able to have the opportunity to attend, some of those are going to be in there as well. I'm going to be dishing out strategies. I'm going to be dishing out tips. I'm going to be dishing out behind the scenes content. I'm going to be giving you all kinds of amazing stuff for $1 a month if that sparks your fancy. So um, I hope you'd consider joining me over on that platform. I think it would be a really good time. I do. I just really want to create a community for people to feel like they can pick my brain if they want. They get a little extra value, uh, really at not much cost because a lot of people are on a budget. So I don't want to, I don't want to break, break, break anyone's bank. 
And the other exciting announcement that I have too is I'm going to be starting a free three-month webinar series uh, dedicated to authorpreneurs that has to do with content marketing. I'm, like I said, I'm a I'm a pretty hard nonfiction, nonfiction girly. So if you are an author wanting to be a business owner or an entrepreneur, if you're an entrepreneur who wants to write a book, uh, we're going to be covering all kinds of topics. The first one being how to identify, how to identify your target audience. Other topics that we're going to be including is building your content brand, crafting compelling content, content, content repurposing, analytics and reporting, as well as how to leverage that that data in those analytics to apply to various forms of content that makes sense for you and your audience. So this is going to be a bi-weekly series. It's all free. If that sparks your interest, definitely consider checking it out. I'll leave information in the description box below if you want to tune into that conversation. If you join my Patreon, you're going to have access to all that stuff as well. But I just wanted to have an open invite for everyone just to kind of build up awareness, provide a little extra value, answer some questions of yours, and you know, you can pick my brain a little bit if you want to. So I just wanted to get some extra cool things happening here on this platform. So I hope you'll consider joining me for one or both of those things, but otherwise that's all I have. Please consider liking and subscribing if you got something out of this video. By doing that, you're letting other people know that this video is worth watching and it's good and it gave you answers and it helps other people find the channel. So definitely consider doing that. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Take care until then. Bye.